228. Let's sing about the cross tonight. 228. That's the wrong one. There's another one, y'all. Look at the other one. Two fifty-five. If we don't like that one, we'll sit, sit, get another one. That's it, y'all. Two fifty-five. I saw we were a little late. We were planning out a couple of events and planning out some music stuff and just took a couple minutes. Um, we'll be in Psalm number 32 this evening. Psalm number 32. My title up at the top said, Blessed are the forgiven. Blessed are the forgiven. Um, some of your... Uh, up under your heading, some of your Bibles may say a maskil of David. Uh, some of them are, are spelled M-A-S-K-I-L, and some of your translations may spell it M-A-S-C-H-I-L, but it's a maskil. Um, this is one of at least seven what we would call penitential psalms, meaning they deal with repentance of sin. Now, this one specifically um, if you'll think, it's, it's, a, it's a psalm of David. So what's the biggest sin issue that he had to deal with? Go ahead. Adultery and then subsequently murder. Two of the Ten Commandments, okay? Murder and adultery. That's two of the Ten Commandments. That's, you know, 20% of the Ten Commandments he just, he, he not only did he commit, what did he do after them? He, he hid it for about a year or so before... Uh, the prophet uh, Nathan called him out on it. So this psalm can kind of connect to Psalm 51 as well, okay, which is a, a, a beautiful uh, psalm of repentance. And so David writes Psalm 32 after confessing his sin, after being called out for his sin publicly, after dealing with it. And in Psalm 51, 13, he, he says that he has basically vowed to uh, use the sin and use the repentance that he had and use that as a way to explain and to, uh, to teach about repentance and to teach about God's forgiveness, which is a beautiful thing. The term there, maskil, uh, is used in like Psalm 42, 44, 45, multiple other psalms. The word itself has been interpreted many different ways because we're not 100% sure what it means. Uh, for example, you know, I've got a little bitty footnote in my Bible and it says probably a musical or liturgical term. We're not 100% sure what a maskil is. Um, 
Some, some look at it as a skillful song or a song of instruction. Some people consider it a contemplative poem. Probably all of those kind of make sense. Because remember, a lot of the psalms were meant to be used in corporate worship. Okay, so you want to, you know, uh, we love the good hymns, but originally there was a time where the hymns weren't even sung. It was just the psalms itself. Like, they're literally, that was what we sang. And, uh, in fact, I want to say, like, the Presbyterian Church, and they literally have a Psalter where, you know, their hymn book, they have a hymn book. It's just nothing but psalms put to music. And you could do a whole lot worse than singing the Bible, right? You could, we could do a lot worse than that. Um, but it's a, some sort of a, uh, instructional type psalm. And obviously, if you think about it being a psalm that's meant to encourage someone to understand forgiveness by understanding repentance, of course, that's instructive of itself. So it may be a musical direction, but to be honest, we don't really know what it means. So those are just some, some ideas there. Uh, verses 1 and 2, Paul quotes in Romans 4, 7 and 8. Okay, so uh, uh, Paul knew that this was a pretty influential and important psalm. Um, in this psalm, um, David shares four truths about sin and forgiveness. Four truths about sin and forgiveness um, that really every one of us needs to understand maybe a little bit more deeply uh, in our lives. So let's read verses 1 and 2 together first. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Um, instead of starting with David's personal catalog of sin, <laughs> uh, again, two of the Ten Commandments he broke, right? Um, David launches in to the concept of forgiveness. Now, is there a time that we need to think about sin? Yes. Okay, because let's just be honest, we need to understand that all of us are sinful people. Everybody in here is sinful at some root. Now, my, my sins may not be your sins, and your sins may not be my sins, and vice versa, but all of us are sinful at some, at some level. David has become to know this because he's been called out for his sin, and he's repentant of his, of his sins. He's repentant of his sins. But he starts out not with the sin, but he starts out with the forgiveness. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Can I just remind us that every one of us by that verse is blessed? Right? That's what he's saying. Blessed is the person whose sins are forgiven. If you're a Christian and you're in Christ, your sins have been forgiven. Therefore, according to verse 1, we're all blessed. Amen? We're all blessed. Everybody in here is, is blessed. And so the first kind of truth here that he talks about is we can enjoy the blessing of acceptance. Now, please understand, the acceptance here comes from the forgiveness. We're not accepted just as we are, okay? We have to be accepted through the forgiveness that Christ gives us. That's how we're, we're accepted. The culture says, no, if you don't accept me just the way I am, you're unloving. That's not true. That's just not, that's just not true, right? We do need to accept people at some level. Yes, absolutely. But just because we love a person doesn't mean we accept what they do or how they live or, or the sins that they're in. I mean, that's not true. That's what the culture's pushing. But David says, we are blessed because our for, we're forgiven. So what that means is I'm no longer defined by my sinfulness. Am I still sinful? Yes. But I'm not defined by that because why? We've been forgiven, right? So we can enjoy the blessing of acceptance only because we've been forgiven, right? So he doesn't start with the sins. He starts with um, praise, really, for his sin being covered. Remember, he's thinking about adultery. He's thinking about murder. Now, Psalm 51, he's going to be a whole lot more negative about it. He's going to be wrecked in Psalm 51. But whether Psalm 32 comes after when he wrote Psalm 51, we don't know the timing. He's now dwelling on the forgiveness that he's got, okay? Uh, chronologically, David's experience of forgiveness only came after a long bout of not dealing with it, okay? He dealt with this and covered it up and thought he had gotten away with it, right? 
But now he's been called out. He's repentant. He's, he's come clean about it. And now he's walking in the acceptance that he has because he's dealt with the sin, right? So now he's entering into this, um, this freedom that forgiveness brings us or offers us. And now because of that, guess what? He can't wait but to talk about it. But he's not going around talking about all of his sinfulness. He's not going around bragging about everything he's done. He's just bragging about the Lord. I've been forgiven. I'm blessed. My sins have been forgiven. They've been covered, it says. And then he says, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. The idea there, iniquity, he talks about transgression and he talks about iniquity. Those are just two of the many words used in the Old Testament for sin, right? The idea of transgression or a, a transgress is just to cross over the line or cross over the boundary. Like the Bible gives us clear boundaries, right? Since we're talking about the adultery, there's nothing wrong with sex in the context of marriage. That's the way God's uh, created it. It's a transgression to go outside of that. That's what David has done. Then he uses the word sin. That means to miss the mark, right? So sometimes we go further than we should, go outside of the bounds in which we have. Sometimes we sin, meaning we're trying our best to do what we're supposed to. It's kind of like an archery term, right? So Abby's taking archery, and it's funny to kind of, not funny, but it's kind of cool to watch her practice, right? Why? There's a target. Like, you know, that's where this thing's supposed to go. And when she started, she wasn't always hitting the thing. In fact, when she first started, my job in the archery practice was to find the arrows that had went into the ground. They were past it, they were in front of it, they were to the right, they were to the left, because she was missing the mark. That's what sin is. Sometimes we're giving it as best we can, and guess what? We just don't hit the mark, right? Sometimes that's the way it is. Then he uses the word iniquity. What some, some people say that just kind of means twisted. Um, the idea is when we do this, we become twisted on the inside. We're knotted up, if you will. And so David had tried to cover his sins and live his life like nothing was wrong, and by all accounts, looked as if everything was fine until Nathan comes and is like, you are the man. If you remember that text, right? Um, he tried, to, tried to, to, to deal or to internalize it, and that wasn't good. Now let's read 3 and 4. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away though my, uh, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as if by the heat of summer. Second truth we see is the foolishness of not repenting. What he's talking about, for when I kept silent about what? His sin. That's what he's saying. When I hid it, when I knew I had done some things I should not have done, he says my bones wasted away. David is basically telling his story here, and he's admitting that it was foolish for him to hide this for a year. That's what he did. Anybody ever covered something up? You ever felt like you were wasting away? Any of us ever have something we're dealing with, and we know we need to deal with it this way, but we know we don't, and then all of a sudden, like, we're exhausted? You're mentally, spiritually, physically even just spent? That's what David was talking about. Um, uh, John Donne, who was an early British preacher, said, Sin is a serpent, and he that covers sin does but keep it warm, that it may sting the more fiercely and disperse the venom and malignity thereof the more effectually. He says, Sin is just like a serpent, and the more we cover it up, the more ready he is to pounce. And the longer he has time to pounce, the worse the bite's going to be. And the longer he has to pounce, the bite's going to have more venom in it. That's what he's saying. And so he is saying here that his bones were wasting away. I think this is a physical and a spiritual thing all at the same time. Okay, now, some of this is guilt, right? Isn't, isn't guilt exhausting? Some of this could also be God's gentle spirit trying to get him to repent. Conviction and guilt sometimes are hard to distinguish, but usually it's the Lord trying to get our attention to lead us back, right? Hebrews 12, God uh, disciplines or chastises those in whom he, what? he loves. 
If God loves us, he wants us to come back. He wants us to deal with it. He wants us to, to get our hearts right. He wants all of us to do that. And he wanted this with David. David was a guy that, what, his, he, it's only, and think about this. David is known as a man, a man after God's own heart, right? It's only after the sin that he's called that. That just blows, it should blow your mind. It's only after he had failed most miserably, and it's only after his worst moment in his life that then God said, he's a man after my own heart. It's not when he was perfect that God said that. It's only after he recognized that he was a real sinful person and he needed just as much grace as everybody else that God says that. So chastening, chastening, however you want to say that word, or, or conviction, this is something that God does to us because he loves us. You ever caught your kid doing something? It's really funny when they're really little, like, you know, something like, you know, like they ate the cookies from the cookie jar and they're all gone and, like, they got chocolate all over the face and you ask them, did you eat any cookies? Mm -mm. Like, you know, like, and you keep asking them the question. Why do you keep asking them the question? You get them to ask the questions. Why? Because you want them to come clean, right? That's sort of what chastening is. God does these things in our life clearly because he's trying to draw us back to us, to himself, rather. He's trying to draw, draw us back. Um, so what David had had to happen to him during these, this roughly year of uh, covering up this sin, first he becomes a, just a physical wreck, According to Psalm 51.8, he was in constant, some sort of physical pain. And the King James says that he was, his body was not just groaning, but it was roaring, I believe is the way it's, it's uh, termed. Sometimes I think God can literally give us physical Ill ailments because of this. Uh, you ever been stressed out and, and all of a sudden you start dealing with migraines? You ever, you, ever, you ever have something wrong spiritually and now all of a sudden you're dealing with sleepless nights or indigestion or high blood pressure or fill in the blank? Sometimes God allows that, I think, to, again, it's not just a spiritual thing. Sometimes our physical body struggles because God's trying to get us back, right? So the hand of God was upon him. And instead of being this young man who was a fierce warrior and who was a man of men and was, a, was valiant and could, even as a little kid, you know, kill the lion and, and bear with his bare hands, here he is, his body's just wasting away because he's covered up this sin and God's trying to get his attention. God disciplines those in whom he loves. So one, another truth for us is to remember is that it's, it's, it's really foolish for us not to, to embrace repentance, right? Now let's read 5 through 7. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. The third truth is just we need to be reminded that uh, the way of deliverance is blessed. It's blessed. It's literally what he says. You surround me, in verse 7, the end of 7, you surround me with shouts of deliverance. Well, if you're a guy and you're physically wasting away, and you're exhausted from hiding this sin and trying to act like you've got everything together. He's the king. He's the guy that knows better, right? Um, this is, you know, you're, you're putting on this show, so to speak. Man, it's got to be a, some shouts of deliverance when that finally, that feeling is, 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 it leaves you because you've repented. You've repented and, and you've turned back to the Lord. Uh, now, for David, the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to deal with it. I've often wondered what would have happened if Nathan hadn't have done what he did. Would he have continued to, to hide it? Would he have continued to live in it? I, we don't know. The point is, is David dealt with it because of the way God had worked it out. And so David's confession was interesting. He says, I've sinned against the Lord. In Psalm 51, he says the same thing. I've sinned against the Lord and you alone. Now, I don't believe that doesn't mean that he didn't sin against Bathsheba. He did. Okay? Uh, in that culture, it's... it's Basically, what it would have amounted to, it's not just that he committed willing adultery, it's that he used this position of authority over her. She could not have said no if she had wanted to. He raped her is what he did. Okay, that's, that's really implied in the text. But all sin ultimately is against the Lord. Doesn't mean it doesn't affect others because it clearly does. Okay. 
but he deals with it. He, he deals. He, he, for, he repents, and he makes it right, and he does everything he can. Um, and so for us today, thankfully, we look at things a little different than David did. David was, David was looking forward to the day where the Messiah was going to come. We already know that the Messiah has come. And so when we repent, Jesus, uh, our God looks at us through the lens of the cross because we've been forgiven, right? And so we have acceptance, which is a beautiful thing, and that's why we have deliverance. David doesn't offer any excuses. He admits that he sinned. He admits that he'd sinned before the Lord and knows he's got to repent, does it publicly. Everybody knows. He does everything that he can to deal with it. We were talking about that last quote about the you know sin is like this serpent just waiting to, to strike. Alexander McLaren, I think he was a Scottish preacher, he said, God's kiss of forgiveness sucks the poison from the wound. And it does. Because sin is poison. It does hurt. It stings. It bites. But God can remove that stain. Right? He sucks that wound clean f- for us because of what he's, he's done. Now, there's the grace of God, which is everyone love We love the grace of God. But there's also something called the government of God, meaning this, that God forgives us in his grace and his goodness and his mercy, but that does not always mean that God saves us from the consequences of what we do, right? God saves us from our sin, but he doesn't always deliver us from the the consequences. David is forgiven, but what does David have to live with for the rest of his life because of his sin? A completely dysfunctional family right he ultimately reaps what he has sown in a sense because of his sin with Bathsheba what happens to the baby that was conceived dies breaks his heart doesn't it breaks David's heart until he comes to himself right Um, David's son Amnon what did he do raped his sister what happened to him he was killed by his other son Then Absalom did what? Tried to kill him to take the throne. As David was dying, another son tried to kill Solomon, his other son. He still has to deal with a whole host of issues, but he's still forgiven. So God saves us, absolutely, but sometimes we still still have to walk in it a little bit, right? And that's tough. That's a hard thing to deal with, but David can deal with these things because he knows he's forgiven. However, like in Psalm 51, he, he's still reminded of the pain that he's caused his family because of what he's done. So it's good for us to remember that we, we are forgiven, but sometimes we still got to walk through whatever we did. And that's a hard thing to do. But it's a lot easier to walk through it when we know God's forgiven us. And just, but also, just because we've been forgiven doesn't mean we don't need to try to make these things right. Sometimes we got to walk and we know God's forgiven us, but we've got to try to make relationships right. and We've got we've to apologize. We've got to seek forgiveness from us. Like those are also things we do because God's forgiven us, right? David was forgiven, absolutely, but he, was still, he still suffered. But even though his family was dysfunctional, his son also builds the temple. And I don't know, the, I think the, the, the longer I'm able to be a father, I see the beauty of that right doesn't it, I mean if we're gonna be if we're gonna suffer for our own mistakes we understand that but all of us want better for our kids right David wants to build the he, David wants to build God this beautiful temple and God's like no I'm not letting you do that but and so I could see David being upset about that but then he says I tell you what I'll let your son do it and I, I'll be I'll be willing to say that for David that was a greater honor than him building it Does that make sense? Just as a parent, right? In that, even though God punished him, he still was gracious to him. So even when God punishes us, he's still good to us, right? He's still good to us. Then lastly, let's read 8, 8 through 11. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or bridle, sorry, or it, may, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. In 8 through 11, we see the last truth, just the joy of obedience. There's joy there in obedience. 
obedience. If this is a mascal, and if a mascal means some sort of psalm used in worship, this would be David now taking his story and saying, here's something you can learn, right? I will instruct you. That's the, the audience. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding. That's good. Let's not be like mules, right? Let's not be like, let's not be like those. Let's be like people that understand the value of repentance and walking in it. That's what he's encouraging us to do. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, uh, but steadfast love, that's this beautiful term here for, for the Old Testament term for grace here. Uh, so I'm going to say it like that. But grace surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord, right? So there's joy in obedience. David's wrong thinking and his sin and his hiding of the sin got him into serious trouble. But the Lord's going to instruct him here, right? God doesn't forgive us of our sins just so we can keep doing it. Right? Like, that's not the purpose in it. Um, he wants us to be better through his spirit and through his leading, right? So he closes, David does, he closes the psalm by really just inviting others to, to worship with him. Look, look at what he says. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Would you rather have sorrows or steadfast love? We can be surrounded by by sorrows because we're not doing what we're supposed to do or we can be surrounded by steadfast love that's much better and if that's true then verse 11 is what we do because of it be glad in the lord and rejoice O righteous and shout for joy all you upright in heart it's interesting that he saw he ends by talking about being upright in heart in verse 11 but in verse 1 he talks about our sins being forgiven the only way we're upright in heart is if we're forgiven. Because we're not upright in our heart, are we? We're sinful, every one of us. We all struggle. But in the end, David's looking at himself, not through his sin. He's looking at himself through grace. One of the things I think that, that guilt or that sin does, I think this may just be a way the devil kind of beats us down and, because we tend to live in guilt and shame, don't we? I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. And guilt and shame are human emotions that we have. But I don't think those are the emotions that the Lord gives us. The Lord wants us to shout for joy because we're upright in heart because Jesus has forgiven us. And because of that, let's stop walking in sin. That's the encouragement. Uh, and so here it is. David is a man after God's own heart. Broke two of the, two of the Ten Commandments. I haven't murdered anybody. Haven't committed an adultery. But then Jesus takes it a step further, doesn't he? Anybody had anger, had a lustful thought? Jesus is now, he takes it further and says, well, we got to deal with the inside here. So on the inside, let's shout for joy because remember what Jesus has done for us. Because we're always going to be simple people. But let's walk in grace. And so that's, that's Psalm 32. Um, Psalm 33 also deals with the steadfast love of the Lord. Um, aren't you glad that there's nothing we can do that can take away the love of God from us? Because if we could do anything to get rid of the Lord's love, we would all do it. Because we're messed up. But God loves us, and he's gracious and kind to us regardless. Uh, and folks, that should be a reason to shout for joy, right? Uh, because as he says, uh, many are the sorrows of the wicked. I don't know if you you just like even watch like three minutes of the news you find that verse to be true right so let's walk uh, in grace that God has graciously and lovingly provided us amen all right let me let me pray for us Lord thank you for this psalm this reminder uh, of the importance of walking in repentance the importance of of taking your word seriously uh, uh, the importance of being honest before ourselves and being for uh, be, and before of you, uh, God, but we thank you for accepting us, not on our works or our goodness or our obedience, but accepting us through the blood of Jesus. Uh, God, thank you for, for loving us and doing what only you could do for us. And God, I just pray that we would be obedient to your word and to be obedient uh, to, to, to what you have called us uh, to do. Lord, we do love you. Uh, God, we thank you for your love for us. And thank you for grace and mercy, and it's in your name that we pray.